our world would not be so great without exploration. <laughs> Open your eyes to discover new horizons. My name is Curiosity. Follow me on this journey. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are on this globe. And welcome again to the Virtual World Conference on Luteinizing Hormone in ART. My name is Robert Fischer, and I am Medical Director of MEDEA, which is Medical Education Academy. And uh, today we have the expert meeting number five. Uh, just some housekeeping information for your uh, CME uh, certificate. You should uh, go to the link at the end of this uh, meeting at the bottom of your screen, and uh, it will uh, link you to a survey. After you finish the survey, uh, you will uh, be um, able to download your certificate uh, for the CME. And. Um, I also want to inform you that uh, during uh, the discussion with the experts of today, you can ask uh, questions, uh, you can put them into the chat room and we shall forward them uh, to the uh, expert uh, who will be discussing uh, your questions. And now it's my pleasure to introduce my co-chair, Professor Sandro Esteves from Campinas in Brazil to introduce you to some more information of today's expert meeting. Please, Sandro. Hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure to participate with my co-chair, uh, Dr. Fischer. Welcome, all of you, to the Media Virtual Conference. I would like to present some more information about our, our program. If I can have the next slide, please. So the conference is starting in September, and it will end next week. We will have the last session uh, next Saturday. We have get more than approximately 1,000 participants for, from over 60 uh, countries across the globe, all continents represented in our meeting. Next slide, please. And next week, we will have our Meet the Expert number six, which relates to lectures 11 and 12, one lecture about ovulation triggering, uh, by Professor Peter Humayden from Denmark, and another uh, interesting talk, Landing in Real World Data by uh, Professor Philippe Lehart, and then we will have the closing ceremony. So today we will have an expert meeting, and I uh, then ask Dr. Fisher to uh, take over, and I will introduce our speaker later on. Thank you, Sandro, and uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce you to uh, Professor uh, Nick Ren Fenning from uh, Nottingham uh, in uh, UK. Hello, Nick. Good nice morning. to have you here with us. Thank and you. Uh, although you are very well known uh, in this world of ART, uh, Sandro will uh, give a short introduction uh, to your uh, person. Please, Sandro. So our expert meeting will be on anthropological count and objective dimension. So this is my great, great pleasure to introduce Dr. Nick Rain Fanning, who is medical director and research lead for Nurture Fertility, part of the Fertility Partnership, one of the leading IVF groups in the UK and in Northern Europe. Uh, 
Dr. Rain Fanning also works as a consultant gynecologist at the Queen's Medical Center in Nottingham, the UK, and within the University of Nottingham as Reader Associate Professor of Reproductive Medicine and Surgery. Nick is well-known, internationally recognized and well-published, and an expert on ultrasound and imaging gynecology in early pregnancy. So Nick, we are very happy to have you with us today. So the stage is yours. I would like you to summarize the video talk you gave us, which is fantastic talk that I invite everyone who could not see it to have a look at Nick's talk, which is very, very educational. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. That's uh, very, very kind of you to say. And I really do hope that uh, the people enjoyed the talk. And um, as you said, it is available for you to, uh, to go back and look at if you've not seen it so far. Um, so just to start with, I would like to thank you for um, giving me this chance to speak today uh, and on, on the meeting, of course. It's a fantastic meeting. Um, I've enjoyed it very much and uh, I've, I've certainly learned a lot, which is always a, a good sign. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit of, just as an overview of my talk about antral follicles, which I'm a, a, a still a huge uh, enthusiast about. And uh, if you see the talk, I'll, I'll run through my view on that and also its role in respect of AMH. My uh, a few disclosures here. Now, I just wanted to start with this, really. So this is a paper we uh, published quite a while ago now, and it, I think it summarizes so nicely for me why we like antral follicles. It's something I find very easy to understand, uh, and I'm a simpleman, so that the simpler things, uh, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and also, I think our patients understand it very clearly. So what we have here is a graph um, along the x-axis of the antral follicle count and then on the y-axis how many eggs we collect and you see there there's a, a, a scattering but there's a, there's a rough relationship and that uh, relationship is about 70 to 80 percent so what that means in real terms is if someone's got a follicle count of uh, say 7 to 10 eggs we would uh, uh, sorry a follicle count of 10 we would expect them to get a 70 to 80 percent yield 7 to 8 eggs at 20, 14 to 16, and at 30, although we don't really want that many, 21 to 24 eggs. So, so this is a, a very simple linear relationship, which, which um, as I said, we find very helpful. What I want you to look at on this slide is a couple of really important bits, which is, first of all, the red line. So the, the, the broken line at the top is if we had a perfect relationship. So we've got 20 follicles, we get 20 eggs, 10 follicles, 10 eggs. Now, Things aren't so perfect in real life, as you know, but what I like is see how very few patients go above that line. So it's very unlikely we're going to get more eggs than our antral follicle count uh, predicts. So in a way, it gives us a ceiling, a safety net. And secondly, if you look at the black circles, which are our pregnancies, and our white circles, which are our non-pregnancies. Now, there's lots that go into successful IVF, and it's not just follicle count, of course. But what you can see here is a real spread of pregnancies throughout. And that's to reiterate the important message that ovarian reserve is not necessarily a predictor of egg quality. And I think we should make sure we're not precluding our patients with poor reserve from having treatment because they still conceive and still have live births. Now, the criticism we get is that we do fancy 3D scanning and we've got lots of very expensive machines and that's why our follow-up accounts are so good. It is not true, I promise you. I wish that was the case, but it's not true. I think what we do is we're really de diligent in how we do our antral follicle count. And what you can see in this study, which is we took this data forward and looked at a thousand patients, and we ended up with this um, uh, model here, where we can see that a follow count of around 20 gave us um, um, a sort of plateauing in live birth rate. And that matched our own data, which we published, showing around up to 15 eggs you see this sort of drop off in pregnancy rate, certainly in a, in a fresh cycle. So, so in our own unit, certainly we are getting really good predictive value. And the reason why is we're really careful how we scan. And this is what I really try to focus on in my talk. So just briefly to summarize that, what you can see here is there are many different settings on these machines. You can change the angle to improve the frame rate so the image refreshes more quickly. And of course you can change frequency, harmonics and gain as you can see here, I've reduced frequency deliberately. So the image quality became poorer, but the follicles became clearer. And it will depend, every patient will be different and every ovary will be different. So you've got to change the settings uh, so that they match what you're trying to do. 
And here's just another brief example. What we've got here on the um, right hand side is images that haven't really been maximized. The top image is not magnified appropriately and the bottom image has been magnified, but there's not been enough attention to the quality to improve. Whereas the image on the left, you can see a properly magnified image with proper resolution, the right penetration, and then you get a very clear and easy reproducible follicle count. And again, there's a lot more in this in the talk of recommendations. And just to finish with, this is the uh, just an overall um, uh, concept that we're working on. Each of these images have been maximized. And what you'll see here is we've got from the left, poor reserve, to the right, high reserve, almost polycystic, and somewhere in between in the middle. And it's just to sort of say that, you know, maybe we don't need to be so precise in our follow-up accounts. We could categorize patients into, you're going to respond poorly, you're going to over-respond, and we need to be very careful, and then somewhere in the middle. And I think that's a very easy way to do that. Can you do that with AMH? I'll leave you to decide, but certainly I think it's very easy to do with follicles if you get your settings right. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Nick. Uh, it was an excellent summary of your presentation. I liked very much your last one uh, slide because that's exactly what I do. Uh, but, uh, I, I guess uh, um, maybe for uh, people with uh, less experience, uh, it is better to really to count the follicles and uh, to learn how to dose and uh, how to go on. Uh, before we go on with some uh, further questions to you, I just want uh, to inform our um, uh, participants today that on the right side, uh, during our discussion time, they will see two multiple choice questions uh, which they can answer. At the end of the discussion, we shall show um, the result of these uh, uh, answers and uh, we would like to ask you to comment on the results uh, to see uh, how the participants have been doing. So, um, Sandro, do you have a question that you would like to ask first? Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Nick, for a very nice summary. So, Nick, I would like to explore a little bit more about your own experience on the antrafolical count. I would like you to share with us, first of all, you think that offline analysis uh, are, let's say, the best approach. I mean, reviewing the images later on and then uh, paying more attention. Uh, and in your practice, Nick, please tell us, how long does it take, for instance, for doing uh, the antrafolical count in different scenarios? Let's consider the three scenarios that we see most often, let's say a patient with poor ovarian reserve and the normal, then a PCOS patient, for instance. How long the doctor has to kind of, uh, uh, I spend actually looking at the antrophobicals. Yeah, no, thank you. It's a, it's a really good question. I think the, the, the last slide that Robert uh, mentioned is probably the key one because my experience, remember the UK is quite different. We're, we're very, the approach with most of the ultrasound is done by sonographers um, and the doctors tend to do less of the, the scanning. And my, I find that when you're having uh, a scan with a sonographer, often there's a lot of detail to measurements you get measurements of the ovary, measurements of the endometrium, every fibre is measured diligently and you get these antrophological counts. But the, uh, the question is, do we need such detailed information? If we spend a lot of time on measurements rather than the overall, um, your scans can take anything from five minutes to tw 25 minutes. So I, I certainly think taking your time is critical, taking your time to get the settings correct and then to scroll through the ovary, count the follicles, and I always do it twice, and take the average and get my patient to count with me. So I've almost got two people counting at the same time. It doesn't take long, even if you've got 20 plus follicles, I, I can certainly do that within a minute for each ovary. Um, your other question about offline analysis, I, I think pretty much all real world data would show anything you do offline is better because uh, it does allow you that time. It, it's got huge potential for post-processing to involve other people, a bit more like the American system where you acquire data and it's measured by somebody else offline. So, but the question is, do we have that um, time and capability in our daily practices? And probably most of us don't. So I think the answer would be, it would be ideal, but maybe not practical. There is a question here from the chat room. Um, what are, you, you mentioned it uh, uh, slightly, but I think they want some more information. 
what are the best settings for the antral follicle count that you should use on your machine? Yeah, again, it, it, it's a really good question. I think the first, the, the fact you're asking the question is brilliant. It's music to my ears. I think so many people start the classic scan, scan the uterus, go to the ovary, go to the other ovary, and there's no change in settings at all. I've seen that on many uh, conferences with live scanning. So I, I think that the, the true answer is there's no set setting. You've got to, when you move to the ovary, you've got to modify your settings, maximize the image, reduce the angle, make sure the focal zone is selected in the right area. And then in principle, with all ultrasound, you should use the highest frequency possible um, so that because that gives you the best resolution. And then every time you change frequency, um, you, you need to change your gain. Because if you put the frequency up, what typically happens, particularly if you're using harmonic imaging, the image gets very dark. And a lot of people, when they do that, automatically don't like the image. They're like a very light gray image. So they, they switch it off. Frequency goes up. There's a new response, which is images a bit dark. And they turn it off. And they go to the lowest frequency in the probe. Often there's a, there's a, a pro penetration mode, which a lot of people use, which is you, you're using the lowest frequency in the transvaginal probe, which is going to give you the lowest resolution. So my recommendation is use the highest frequency, but always adjust the gain. So it's like driving a car, well, an old fashioned car with a clutch. Every time you put the accelerator down, you change the clutch and so on. So, so, and then you go to the other ovary and you change again. And if that ovary is more distant, you're going to need to bring your frequency down. So, one size doesn't fit all, I'm afraid. So I need, can, I, can, I, can I make a comment, uh, Robert? Uh, Nick, yeah, sure. you mentioned in your talk very nicely in terms of the standardization that we, although we have paper, classic paper by uh, the group of Frank uh, Brookmans on uh, AFC standardization, it seems that there are some things missing uh, in terms of standardization, the technical issues that you mentioned and then discussed it so brilliantly during your talk. Uh, what we need now in terms of uh, guidelines, could you kind of highlight if there's a need of a new guideline, if you if you feel it's important for, for us uh, in this field, and what would be the uh, things that we will need to add in these new guidelines, let's say? Yeah. No, I, I, I completely agree. I think it's a really important point. I, it's quite a hard guideline because it's a sub, at the end of the day, it's a subjective assessment, but there are some very basics that we could do that we could run almost like an FOP across that people, particularly people coming to Alcatan who are training now, that they understand the basic physics of the machine um, and then that they do a certain number of scans. What I'd like to see is some gold standards and some audit being introduced into our practices. So, you know, if, if, a, if a unit typically has a, a an antropod count that's low, that's lower than their AMHs, that they're probably not counting enough follicles. So we need a guideline to look at the, the settings that each setting is at least considered in every scan, every ovary, left and right. And then we also need some local practice with regard to training, audit, audible standards. So we're watching our practice. And as I showed you at the beginning of my talk, you know, there is no way that you can have an AMH of 20 with a follow count of nine. These follicles are being missed, whereas a lot of the studies are saying us sonographers are counting too many. It's not true. The opposite is true. We are undercounting follicles mm -hmm. and then we get nervous in our practice because people over respond. So uh, um, yeah, I, 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 would, I think we absolutely need such a guideline and it would have international relevance because scanning is the same in Brazil, Argentina, Australia, New Zealand, Germany, UK. Excellent. Thank you, Axel. Uh, just, just to comment on, on that, um, I think uh, that there is sometimes a misunderstanding because there are fluctuations uh, in the waves of the follicle that we uh, will arrive. and. Uh, AMH uh, is uh, usually telling us not the follicles that we, that we see exactly today, but uh, that that will come maybe the next month or some weeks later, uh, because it's a much earlier state, and some of this follicle will, will die, will disappear. So yeah. I think uh, sometimes the discrepancy between the AMH and the number of the antral follicles might be also explained uh, by by this. Uh, I want to th to hear your thoughts about that. No, I, I think that's exactly right. I think that's what it that that is what's happening. I mean, we've known for quite a long time that if we want to do a cycle independent follicle count, we need to be measuring the smaller follicles. 
once we've gone beyond six millimeters, those follicles are FSH dependent, as, as we know. So, so we really shouldn't be including those in our predictive count. Um, but actually, we've done quite a lot of work on this. The number of follicles that are above six millimeters is actually quite low. And people have talked, should you count two to nine, two to six, two to five, everything up until five. We found, particularly when we've done 3D and automated analyses, that actually most of the follicles are five or six millimeters and, and smaller. But I think you're right, Robert, the discrepancies with the AMH, sometimes that's exactly what's happening. Um, and particularly as the woman or the reserve gets older, you see these larger follicles that seem to lose their control. And those are the ones that we believe don't develop. And we've been working with um, GE and Merck at the moment, trying to see, can we identify follicles and watch their individual growth and predict? And it's much, it's pretty tricky, I can tell you, but um, some follicles still surprise us. You can have larger follicles that you would imagine would be atretic, and they actually grow and produce a mature egg. Um, very hard to follow that egg to blastocyst uh, for other reasons. So, yeah, a lot more work is needed. Just had it yesterday. Uh, that there was a follicle that I was uh, observing that was big from the beginning. I thought it's uh, probably an old follicle. It went up to I think almost thirty millimeters when when we triggered, and all the other follicles came out. But there was a mature egg in there. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, it was quite, uh, it's not always very predictable. But there is a question here for our second expert today, uh, Filippo Baldi. And um, um, the question is, uh, do you think it is important uh, when you have, let's say, more than 50 follicles to count exactly how are they? Uh, or do you think uh, it is important uh, when there are five to six follicles to be more extremely precise uh, for clinical practice to, to count more exactly? Yeah, no, it's, it, it's a great question. And I, uh, I, I'm second guessing why Philippe has asked that, but I, I, I think the answer is no. Uh, there, are, there are two things. So with that last model I showed you where we've got people with a high antrophollicle count, we know they, they're going to potentially over respond and we've got to be careful and safe. So I think my answer would be, if we know someone's got the potential to produce more than 15 eggs, and that, that's certainly where we aim to get people, try not to get more than that because we, we know there may be an improvement in cumulative live birth but we have to very carefully balance that against over response. So if we feel we can get 15 eggs, then we need to adopt a protocol that's safe. So we're looking obviously at antagonist protocols and lower dose of gonadotrophins. So really, whether you've got 20, 25 or 50 shouldn't change your approach. <laughs> the only caveat to that is, and I do think this is a real key area, certainly one we struggle with, is these patients are, the difference between a multi follicular ovary and a polycystic ovary, and those women that do not respond in a predictable manner, that they, even with high or low doses, tend to not respond and then suddenly boom, and, and often produce a lot of eggs that are immature and poor quality. So we are still looking at the high-end group uh, with more than 15, 20 follicles to see, can we identify a phenotype, a polycystic phenotype that predicts aberrant response and poor quality eggs? But I don't think it changes your protocol in answer to Philippa's question. There is another question here. Are you uh, showed in your um, uh, presentation the Sono AVC, the automatic uh, way to measure? Now, in the Sono AVC, you showed it very nicely. You see a lot of little follicles that you you will not catch uh, with, with your eye probably. And now the question is, if you do that, how how that correlates to to what you see? If you do a very precise, uh, let's say. Uh, two-dimensional uh, uh, scan because yeah. you will see a lot of more follicles actually and are, are they clinically relevant in the, that cycle at all or are, are they misleading you in, in the dosing uh, for, for the, the yeah. patient? You might be under dosing because the, those follicles are not relevant. Yeah, no, another good question. I, th I think actually in my experience the opposite is true. The opposite is true. So in, in my talk where I show this this typically in a lot of the study, the, the four count is lower than the AMH. It doesn't make physiological sense to me. So I think we are undercounting. So, so these smaller follicles, they do respond. And we know follicles of 0.6 millimeters will are FSH responsive and will increase in size. So I, I don't think we're overcounting. I think we're actually undercounting. And what we found that when we do 3D, your numbers do go up. Um, the, the numbers go up. But I think it's not so much the 3D. I think it's the fact you're more attention in the count 
Um, the automated count we really liked because I think if it, you often, I think you underestimate the count or sometimes you can count follicles twice and the Sony VC stops you doing that. You cannot physically count them twice because they're colored in. But the problem with it is it's, it's not a perfect process. So if the image quality is not great, um, then you, you won't work on all the follicles. But as I showed you, if you're ending up having to count five or six follicles rather than 20, it's much easier to count a smaller number. So yeah, we're, we're big fans of it, but you do need to really work on that 2D image quality. Very good. I think we have our um, multiple choice question results now. So maybe we can show them to you. And uh, can we start with the first questions, please? So if you would like to comment on the question and the result, uh, Nick. Yeah, so frame rate is, is something that a lot of doctors pay little attention to, whereas our sonographers are, are trained on this from, from day one. So frame rate is the literally like our HD TVs. How, how is the image refreshing? Now, if you take a snapshot picture, it doesn't matter. But if you're doing a dynamic scan, so you're looking for, for say, a fetal heart or you're doing a follicle count where you're scrolling through the object of interest, frame rate is really important so you need to at, get the highest frame rate possible so your eye can see the the differences in follicles particularly if image quality is not great now if you zoom out increase the frequency or reduce the gain they'll well gain and frequency will have no effect on frame rate but zooming and the angle have a huge impact so you want to work on the area of interest so reduce the um, angle and magnify so you're focusing just on that ovary and then your the image will refresh much more quickly and it will improve your ability to see and count those follicles. And I think uh, you did a very good uh, job uh, uh, in your presentation because 75% uh, uh, really answered correctly to your question. Can we have the second uh, question, please? <laughs> so again, well done though, 75%. So, so yes, so the difference here is this is more about the static image. So if you want to get the best possible image, we need to use the highest frequency um, uh, that we have available to us. I always give a very simple analogy. The best way to get high frequency, and we do every day in practice, is transvaginal versus transabdominal imaging. So this, once you've got the frame rate correct, you want to get the highest resolution, and that's using the highest frequency you can do um, as long as you can still see. If, it's, if it, the image becomes too dark, you may need to reduce the frequency. So well done then. We seem to have the, the same 75% experts in ultrasound uh, <laughs> measuring of follicles. So, Good. Good thank you very much Nick, for being here with us today and sharing your experience. And we hope to see you soon somewhere else uh, in person physically, not only on the screen. And that would be uh, safe and healthy. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Really enjoyed it and congratulations. It's a fantastic, uh, fantastic meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Cheers. Okay, so let's go now to the second expert of today. And I invite uh, Professor Filippo Baldi from Rome, Italy to join us. So welcome, Filippo, uh, to stay with us at the expert meeting. Uh, Sandra Stavius uh, will introduce you to the participants today. Thank you. Hi, Filippo. Uh, Hi. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Filippo Baudi. Dr. Baudi is medical director, uh, clinical director of the Geneta Centers for Reproductive Medicine in Italy, a center with many units in Rome, Marostica, Umbertid, and Naples. Filippo is well known of all of us with many uh, publications on reproductive medicine. He's author or co-author of many books, many papers. He was member of the ASHRAE Executive Committee during 2005, from 2005 to 2009, and was chairman of the ASHRAE annual meeting that was held in Rome in, in 2010. Uh, Filippo got a license as full professor in obstetrics and gynecology and has been the technical advisory board uh, member established by the Italian Ministry of Health on uh, heterologous fertilization. 
And today, Filippo is here with us because he provided us a very nice overview about the uh, Duo Sting protocol that he has very much contributing to the literature and also to the practical uh, experience of many doctors around the world. It was a fantastic talk that I had the pleasure to watch and recommend to all my colleagues in the clinic. And I hope you also had a chance to look at it. So I would like Filippo to um, take the center stage now, summarize the contents of his talk, and then hopefully we'll have a very nice discussion uh, later on. Thank you, Filippo, the stage is yours. Thank you, thank you, Sandro. Thank you, Robert. First of all, it's a great pleasure to uh, to be together with friends since many, many years, at least uh, uh, via web. Uh, I hope to join together, besides science, also friendship in meetings uh, in um, all over the world. Um, thank you for your very kind introduction. And I'm going to uh, make a sum up of the, uh, my presentation on follicular waves during the natural cycle and uh, with the use of dual steam in Poseidon groups. So this is, uh, this is my uh, de declaration of my conflict of interest. And first of all, uh, for which patients is this protocol recommended? This, page, this protocol is recommended first, mainly, but we will discuss also that not only for poor prognosis patients, but mainly this protocol is recommended for poor prognosis patients. But who is a poor prognosis patient? Uh, it is for sure a poor responder that for different reasons responds poorly to control barrier stimulation, reducing the number of oocytes, the number of embryos, and the four they will reduce the chance to have a live birth. But a poor prognosis patient is also a patient with an advanced maternal age. That's very often these advanced maternal age patients are also poor responders. And these patients have a higher rate of aneuploidy oocyte besides this low number of oocyte. And a higher rate of aneuploid embryos and the four, they will have a lower chance of a live birth. So the key issues that deal with poor prognosis patients are very low success rate with standard mild treatment or natural cycle IVF. Whatever we do for these patients, they will have poor uh, uh, results. Reduce time available to try to conceive. We must try to use treatment aiming to shorten time to pregnancy. And this is a very good issue that we are going to discuss in the presentation. High, high incidence of dropouts and also this is a very good issue. We must try to use strategy to reduce the dropout rate. So this is uh, the, uh, the, the table that uh, summarize the uh, clinical and laboratory, the laboratory results, and then the clinical results of uh, uh, one of the most important sp papers that we published on human reproduction in 2018. And this paper, uh, was uh, uh, on 170 patients that uh, uh, finished the follicular phase stimulation, the luteal phase stimulation. And then, as you can see from this table, uh, in the, after the luteal phase stimulation, we, 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 we will have a significantly higher number of oocytes, and uh, we will have a significantly higher number of blastocysts. And since the euploidy rate is... Uh, is, uh, is uh, comparable, we will have a significantly higher number of euploid blastocysts uh, compared to the follicular phase uh, stimulation. And when we are going to transfer, and these were uh, only uh, 62 and 64 uh, single blastocyst, single euploid blastocyst transfers, when we transfer uh, blastocysts from, obtained from the follicular phase or blastocysts obtained from the luteal phase, uh, euploid blastocyst obtained from the follicular phase and from the luteal phase, then we will have uh, a comparable live birth, live birth rates. And uh, this is uh, another study that we published uh, on the same year or the, the year later, no, the same year. And uh, this is a multi-center study where more than 350 patients that fulfilled both the, uh, the uh, follicular phase and luteal phase stimulation were uh, uh, were included, and uh, uh, the, the the most important clinical message 
from this uh, strategy, this uh, strategy of uh, stimulation, is that after the dual, the dual stimulation, we will end up with 65% of patients that they will have, um, that they will have uh, um, uh, at least one employed blastocyst per ovarian cycle. And if we do only a, a standard uh, follicular phase stimulation, sorry, uh, what's happened? So, so if we if we do only a standard follicular phase stimulation, then we will have uh, only forty two percent of patients that they will have um, they will have uh, an euploid blastocyst. So this means that per variance cycle per time unit. If we do a conventional stimulation, we will have 42% of patients with at least one euploid blastocyst. And if we do a, 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 a dual stimulation, we will have 65% of these patients, increasing the chance of, a, of an embryo transfer and increasing the chance of a live birth. So this is um, one of the, our latest um, papers published on fertility sterile. And, uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the main question was, uh, is the dual stimulation uh, a good strategy uh, uh, treatment in uh, very, very poor responder patients, in Bologna patients? So we compared uh, 100 Bologna patients where, we, they were, where they accepted to do the dual stim and 197 uh, Bologna patients that they underwent, they accepted to, to uh, do two consecutive uh, stimulation cycles. So the first thing that we observed, it was the dropout. Of course, in the dual steam, 100% of the patients uh, completed the luteal phase by definition, because this is, was, the, uh, was the protocol. And uh, in, the, in the conventional control virus stimulation group, only 17% of those, uh, sorry, only 17 uh, of those patients that failed the first conventional stimulation underwent a second conventional stimulation. So we had uh, um, a dropout of uh, 90%. And when we looked at the number of days between the first or second retrieval and the second one, then you can see that the dual steam was 15.8 days as a mean number of uh, days between the two or second retrieval and in the conventional stimulations, uh, it was 141. And when we looked at the uh, when we looked at the um, at the patients uh, that had at least one live birth per intention to treat, then we obtained fifteen percent with the dual stim and eight percent with with the conventional stimulation. This difference was not so statistically significant, although we found a trend. So this is this was my last uh, last slide. But in the lecture there are many other many other slides with several other papers showing uh, uh, what is good and what not is good uh, for uh, the, this approach. And, um, and I would like to hear, and that can be discussed, that so far the dual steam is recommended by the uh, ESHRE, the new ESHRE guidelines on ovarian stimulation as a, as a research protocol. But I know that uh, uh, after that uh, uh, other papers that have been published and we published last month a paper on the on the um, clinical and uh, um, neonatal outcomes of the babies born after the follicular phase stimulation the luteal phase stimulation showing absolutely no differences uh, between the babies born after the transfer of uh, blastocyst obtained from the follicular phase stimulation or blastocyst protein after the follicular phase stimulation. So uh, after all this literature, and not only from our groups, but also uh, from independent other groups, uh, then I heard that uh, uh, the, uh, the recommendation of using the dual steam as a research protocol can be changed. Uh, I thank you for uh, your, sorry, I thank you for your, um, Attention, and then uh, I'm ready to answer to your questions. Thank you very much, Filippo, and I'm glad that uh, about the news of uh, changing uh, in the guidelines of ESHRE, uh, uh, moving away from uh, being just a research project, because I think uh, you are right. There is enough evidence there now that it is a help. 
And uh, before we go on with the discussion, just to remind the participants that during the discussion, they will see on the right side two multiple choice questions that you have prepared and they can answer to them during the discussion. At the end of the discussion, we shall show the results and you can comment on the question at the end. So Sandro, do you have already a first question? Of course, I have many, but I will just make one. So, Filippo, thank you very much for sharing uh, the nice experience with the Duos team. Well, uh, first of all, I think the guidelines are, let's say, are guidance for clinicians, but they are not the ultimate word. And what we see in other areas of medicine as well is actually the guideline are used, but clinicians need to have the, let's say, the, the decision-making process with the patient, provide we uh, um share with the patients the limitations and the advantages, I think the final decision should be uh, made in common sense. And I think uh, the dual steam protocol, at least the way we see here, is like that. But my question to you is concerning a practical case, uh, Filippo. For instance, we have many cases here of men with azosper, azospermia in which we do sperm retrieval. So, uh, and the, uh, and the uh, partner is, uh, fitting the Duostin, let's say, approach. And we are many times faced with the decision of doing the uh, sperm uh, extraction procedure in the first uh, Duostin arm, so follicular, follicular phase stimulation, and then the embryo biopsy. And then we freeze the sperm for the second, let's say, luteal phase stimulation, or we do the dual steam, freeze the eggs, do the luteal phase stimulation, and do the biopsy later on with the 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 the, 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 the whole batch of eggs from the first and second one. So could you could you uh, guide us on the best way to manage such a case? Uh, stimulation retrieval. Um, biopsy or fine needle, uh, insemination, crowd preservation of sperm retrieved, and then uh, starting again the uh, uh, blastocyst. If you want to do uh, PGTA or not, freeze the blastocyst, mm -hmm. and then uh, and then uh, new stimulation. The reason why uh, I prefer to inseminate the oocyte is because the survival rate of the blastocyst after warming is um, 99%, more than 99% in our, in our hands. And the survival of all sites is uh, uh, in our hand about 85%. So uh, if you identify the all site, then you will have a, a lower number of, compared to the blastocyst, of the all site to uh, to use when you warm them. So I, I recommend to I recommend to to inseminate and to vitrify the blastocyst. Excellent. Thank you very much, Filippo. Very useful. I have a question also to you, Filippo. Um, let's say you decided uh, to go to a second stimulation. You discuss with a patient and you look. Uh, you wait four days. So you look on day five, and uh, you don't see antral follicles. W w would you start the stimulation anyway uh, and hope that uh, they will appear? Or in that case, you will just abort the situation and start in the next cycle? Robert, you... Robert, I, I recommend, and it, it, it should be a must. Well, it's more than a recommendation. I, of course, I, I'm, I'm joking, but uh, don't do an ultrasound day five after the ocean retrieval. Because you will see a mess, you cannot you cannot understand anything. Start and then do an ultrasound six or seven days after the stimulation. Because if you do an ultrasound day four, again you will abort the stimulation because you cannot see anything. You only see the corporal luteal. <clears throat> so don't don't do a, a blood analysis. Don't do an ultrasound because it is completely different from the paradigm that we have been used in the last 35 years. Um, 
But uh, we, we have the situation, or well, at least in, in my case here, that uh, we, we, we started with a second stimulation and for a week or so when we checked that there was no follicle growing. And it took a, a very long stimulation actually uh, in our, after we started seeing some follicles appearing. Uh, the, the reason I ask is because sometimes the, the second wave might be, and I, I remember your first slide some years ago on the old stimulation when you just started, you might have a, a very small uh, wave or a, a zero wave uh, coming from, from the second wave. Uh, let's say that in 70% of, uh, of the second wave, well, the second wave, uh, indeed, I, uh, and, the, and the most the criticism that I had, and then I think they are right, it's not a follicular phase and luteal phase stimulation, but there are two stimulations uh, uh, on uh, because I believe that there are not really waves, but the, that the continuous recruitment in the in, in the in the ovaries. Maybe this continuous recruitment is after one week, ten days, and then whenever you start the stimulation, you will be ready to find some follicles that will be ready to to push. So uh, in seventy percent of uh, of the patients, and now we did more than one thousand cycles of dual stimulation. In seven in seventy percent, we will obtain more oocyte from the luteal phase than from the follicular phase, and this makes overall as a mean a significantly higher number of oocyte retrieved. But indeed, there are some there are some patients that in the luteal phase they will have a, a lower number of oocyte than in the follicular phase, or in some in some patients in some patients. And uh, these some patients is higher than uh, in the follicular phase stimulation. In some patients, we cancel the luteal phase stimulation in a significantly higher number than we cancel in the in the in the follicular phase. So um, indeed, uh, uh, I cannot. I, I don't know. I don't know why in some patients you have a, in the most of the patients you have a higher number of follicles and why. In other patients, you have a significantly lower number of follicles. I don't think it's a question of uh, to check on uh, on the on the number of follicles that you see. Um, I think that uh, it could be uh, because you use the um, ACG trigger, or you use the analog trigger. No, we use we use general trigger. Always, Always. Yes. You, you, yeah. you use I don't use ACG. Uh, Robert, I cannot answer to this question, uh, but uh, we never check uh, a the ultrasound, okay. never. Yeah, and and uh, do you have uh, the second the follicular phase uh, much longer as the, uh, the sorry the luteal phase longer as the follicular phase? Is one uh, one one two days longer? Yeah, just one two. Uh, Philip, Filippo, I want to to ask you concerning uh, the other way around. I mean, uh, starting with the luteal phase stimulation and then moving to the follicular phase stimulation, eventually allowing the fresh embryo transfer. What is your reaction to this uh, my, say, idea? My, my reaction to this is I'm very, very uh, uh, positive to do this with regards to the number of oocyte retrieved. I mean, uh, it, it's not important whether you start in the follicular phase or in the, in the luteal phase. The importance on the second stimulation is uh, probably the higher level of estradiol and the higher level of, of uh, progesterone that, it, that you have as a priming of the second, of the uh, improved recruitment in the second stimulation. Uh, theoretically, Theoretically, you can do the embryo transfer. You can do the embryo transfer, but uh, I mean, uh, as far as I know, nobody tried and controls the chance of live birth after the transfer of uh, uh, the second stimulation in the follicular phase. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know the receptivity of this endometrium after two consecutive stimulation. Okay, so we have now uh, a question from. Uh, and I think the only, sorry, Robert. And I think that the only way to know is to try. But right. I can see some ethical issues to try uh, to do a transfer, maybe of the only euploid blastocyst uh, in patients where you are not sure whether you are throwing them in the basket 
or in a uh, in a prepared uterus. Okay, thank you, Filippo. Uh, there is a question from uh, the audience: Is it necessary to use GnRH antagonists in the luteal phase stimulation? Uh, I think not. I think not because in the luteal phase stimulation uh, you have a high high level of uh, progesterone and uh, higher level of of estradiol, uh, uh, but especially of progesterone. And um, I so unless the patient does not menstruate, it means that you have high level of progesterone. So you don't need uh, you don't need uh, a generate antagonist. But most of these patients menstruate after four or five days from the stimulation. And this is, if it, this is a good sign from uh, the progression of the stimulation, this is a bad sign that it means that progesterone went low and then uh, you could have the risk of uh, a premature age. Yeah, I agree with you. There is also another question here from the chat room. Uh, is it necessary to... No, this is the same one. Sorry, it was double clicked. But uh, now we have uh, the result already uh, from uh, the multiple choice question. Unless uh, you, Sandro, have another questions on your side? No. So yeah, I can I can just make a quick one uh, to Filippo in terms of the Poseidon groups, uh, Filippo. What will be the uh, your priority? I mean, to recommend for the clinicians, which is patient that according to the Poseidon classification, you would recommend a consideration uh, about the Dewey-Sting approach? Um, I, would I would recommend a group, for sure, group uh, uh, two, three, and four. Not group one, because they are young patients and then you have a, a quite good number of, uh, of uh, all sites. Uh, group two, although the water reserve is it could be uh, okay, but uh, the the low number of oocytes that you retrieve have a higher chance to have uh, to have uh, uh, right, an employee. And then group three and four, because the you have anyway uh, a lower number of oocytes. But group what three group three, Filippo? Would you recommend PGTA? In group three, uh, in that case. we recommend PGTA after 35 years of age. We do routinely after 35 years of age. Before 35 years of age, a woman of uh, as a first as a first attempt, a woman of uh, 32, 33, I would not recommend uh, a PGTA. Uh, although, um, if uh, the patient uh, wants to. Uh, to avoid useless transfers or reduce the chance of miscarriages, then uh, then why not? Uh, the issue of PGTA, it's only one, is uh, if the lab and if the centers does many, many biopsies and uh, PGTA cycles, then uh, PGTA is completely um, uh, safe. If the site, if the center does three PGTA per year, it's better not to do, because then you will damage you will damage the embryos. So this is the issue of PGTA, and this is uh, the um, the uh, the polemics that have been done on PGTA, because of course uh, to do PGTA in a routine way. You must have a very, very technical lab. You must have a lot of, of people, biologists in the lab. And who cannot offer this says that PGTA is it's not, it, it's not valid. But, uh, but I would add uh, maybe two more indications uh, to the ones that you have said in the young patients, uh, those who are uh, multiple uh, recurrent implantation failure and those who with recurrent uh, pregnancy loss. Um, yes. especially if it was genetically uh, oriented. Absolutely. So, thank even in the young patient, we shall recommend uh, to the PGTA. But uh, Robert, in fact, I said, if a patient comes for the first attempt... Yes, I then of course, no. then of course the no. Situation, of course, yes. No. But let me say before concluding, 
But let me say before concluding, uh, is that uh, the dual stimulation uh, was born from the original, because the original idea, it was not, it was not mine, but it was from Huang. That for yeah. the first time, that for the first time he did it. Um, so came from poor prognosis patients. But I think, and this is uh, how now we use and we, we, we move uh, with the patients with, with the dual stimulation. I think that the dual stimulation cannot, the strategy cannot be decided before starting the first stimulation, but should be decided after five days from the first stimulation. So after you have obtained the blastocyst. And after you have obtained the blastocyst according to the number of, of to the age of the patients, it doesn't mean if I have a woman of 32, okay, 32. At 32, the nucleoide rate is 50%, 50, 60%. It has 10, that does 10 oocytes as an antrophological count. So she does not need a, a, a dual stimulation. But at the end of the story, she will end up with one blastocyst. And uh, the uploidy rate of this, uh, of this blastocyst is uh, uh, 60%. So the chance to find an uploid one is not good. So although she was not a candidate at the beginning of the dual stimulation, then at the end, she deserves, or, or, or at least uh, we can discuss with her uh, to start a new stimulation. Or in the other way around, if you have a patient that uh, is candidate as a as a dual stimulation, because uh, at the answer follicle count, she has four follicles. But at the end of the day, she will have a three blastocyst, so she will not start again the dual stimulation. So now we decide whether to do the dual stimulation after having obtained uh, the number of blastocysts, and then after making a, a sort of prediction to find in that pool of blastocysts whether there will be uh, the blood nuclear blastocysts or not. And and when you do the PGTA or not, because I mean the prediction is also if you don't do the uh, the, uh, the, the PGTA. Yeah, thank you very much for this comment, uh, uh, Filippo. Now we have to move uh, due, due to the short time. And uh, let's have a look at the multiple choice question. The first one is coming. So can you uh, just comment on the question and on the result, please? So which statement is false regarding ovarian stimulation? Follicular phase stimulation is an effective method in uh, for emergency fertility preservation, and uh, yes, indeed, uh, is uh, is false. So uh, very good. Okay, and uh, next, uh, the seventeen percent maybe are from uh, from Netherlands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, and uh, the next uh, question uh, now here is a little bit different answer uh, quality. Uh, In a spot analysis of the dual steam protocol, which is regarded as uh, strength, higher number of oocytes and embryos that are obtained through the variant cycle. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the strength. Differences in competence between oocytes are observed after, no, this is absolutely not, because there are no differences in competence between uh, a blastocyst or the for also coming from the follicular phase and the luteal phase. So this was uh, uh, this was not understood by by the uh, attendee. Mm -hmm. Okay, probably they were misled by the situation that uh, you might have some more oocytes in the second uh, stimulation, and that's why the answer came that way. Anyway, thank you very much, Filippo, for joining us today. It was a pleasure. So for the discussion and for the excellent presentation that you have uh, provided us uh, summary today and also recorded uh, some days ago. And stay thank safe you, and healthy. Yes, thank you. In I miss you all of you, so I hope to see you soon uh, in uh, presence. Yes. yes, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
And now it's my pleasure together with Sandro to summarize maybe uh, today's uh, meeting. Sandro, would you like to do that? Sure. Today we have very nice AI uh, expert meetings, one on anthropological count, uh, very nice overview about the technique, how we need to improve our practices using the anthropologicals uh, in the daily routine, the technical aspects by uh, Nick Fanning from the UK. And we also had in the second expert meeting, uh, Dr. Filippo Baldi discussing about the clinical uh, utility of the dual-sting protocol in several clinical scenarios, including the Poseidon groups, so I was uh, very excited to hear this uh, very educational discussion we had. And thank you all for being with us today. And before we completely finish today, I would like to draw your attention uh, for the next expert meeting next week uh, on lectures number 11 by Peter Humaidan on ovulation triggering and the luteal phase, and num lecture number 12 by Philippe Lehert uh, on uh, the world uh, uh, data, real world data, more on statistics and uh, information on that kind. And uh, just to remind you again to use the link on the bottom of your screen when we finish uh, to go to the survey, answer the questions to have access uh, to your uh, CME uh, certificate. It was a pleasure to be with you today here with the experts and also with my co-chair, my friend Sandro Esteves. And I would also like to thank everybody at the background, uh, Chloe, uh, Antonietta, who made all this uh, uh, possible for us today, but also the technicians, Paolo and Francesco, uh, for helping us to have a smooth uh, work uh, during the day. Stay all safe and healthy and hope to see you again uh, next week at this time. Goodbye and have a good weekend.